Mr. World unleashes chaos. Selene panics, and Shadow gets a taste of the power within. It's the season finale of American Gods, Season 2, Episode 8, Moon Shadow. Not the cat Steve. Hey everyone, D here, and welcome to this week's review of American God. So yes, of course, spoilers are ahead. And do want to remind you about our quick jump index system. Just take a look down in the description below. You'll get a whole little listing, a little breakdown of this review. Timelined out, you can jump to your favorite parts, re-watch the review if you want. Watch it in any order you'd like. Anyway, there for you. All right, so uh, season finale, the end of this particular season of American Gods, and I think they left mostly on a high note. Uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of feel in this episode that reminded me a lot of season one. One of the reasons I started watching this show, one of the reasons it grabbed me so much, it had a lot of the same dynamics. It had a lot of the same movement. Uh, the only regret that I have is I really feel like. You know, I wish this was like episode five of the season, because, you know, obviously there would be some more. Uh, but I do really feel like so much of the season has gotten sort of stretched out. There was a lot of filler in there, and it was like we're finally getting to some of the movements. Uh, we're finally getting some of the war actually happening. Shadow is coming to some actual uh, <laughs> realizations as opposed to just being knocked over the head with clues and, and instances all around him that he's not piecing together. So, um, yeah, I'm glad we've gotten forward on this. I'm glad Shadow has his realization. I'm glad that we are moving from Cairo because we, we have been there pretty much all season long. Uh, and, and I'm glad that the war itself really is starting to, to manifest. And we're getting to see how this is happening. How the gods was actually going to really start warring against each other. It's not going to be line up of forces on this side, forces on this side. It's not, you know, this isn't Captain America Civil War. We're not going to have two lines of forces going and throwing punches. Uh, they're going to fight differently. And we start to get a little taste of that this episode. So that's something I'm really glad that we're finally moving forward. It's just unfortunate that this is now the season finale and now we're gonna have to wait all the way up until season three. Hopefully just a year. I do know that they've had it renewed for season three already. They do have a new showrunner announced. Um, so I am hoping that that means by next year we'll have season three and we don't have to hold, do a whole another two year wait because man that would suck. And so, to me, one of the things that really was very reminiscent of our episodes back in Season 1 is the opener that we had. And I think it was just, it was marvelous. It gave us a big story. We have Crispin Glover doing his Crispin Glover stuff. Um, and it really relates into what's happening throughout the rest of the episode, rest of the episode especially coming from World's point of view from from his attack so i think there was a perfect opener perfectly done uh just again uh i loved it i love the whole opening bit in fact we are going to call it our scene of the week for this week and yes i know technically it's a sequence it's not just one scene but we're gonna call it that anyway just because it was it was perfect it really was this is using an actor to their fullest. Give Crispin Glover a nice, creepy monologue. Focus on him. Let him tell that story. And he will reinforce all of the imagery and just kick it up to that next level. Um, using, uh, as their storytelling, the War of the Worlds radio play back in 1938. It's legendary. I know you know you all probably know what this is. Briefly, for those that do not, uh, 1938, Orson Welles and his theater company did a radio play of War of the Worlds. It was adapted. The original book takes place in England. The original story does. It was adapted for the radio and was done as a news story. Um, most people listening to it, 
they knew that it was a show and had a great time for it. They started it out like it was a musical program and then set it up as the news interrupts this musical program with these uh, tales of aliens landing. The legend really gets built out of this radio play, which is sort of what World is implying through this opening bit, is that a lot of people turned in late to the radio play. Uh, there was, I believe, a baseball game, might have been the World, let's see, it was uh, October, uh, October 30th, 1938, so I believe there was a game of some sort. I think it was baseball, but I can't be certain here. Um, finished up late, so when that was done, a lot of people turned over and got onto the Orson Welles radio program, and this sounded like an interrupted news program about aliens landing. There are debates on how many people actually panicked, believing this to be real, but there is a sufficient amount in that it backs up world story here, in that if you think that something is there, if it is introduced to you, that can manifest fear. Fear is really the guiding point of the world. It's not love, it's fear. What do you say? You don't lock your doors because you love your neighbors, you deadbolt them because you fear them. And you're not even aware of things. When things are introduced to you, they become real because of fear. You just have an idea of things. But it's when fear manifests itself that they become real. Uh, and this is world's power, that manifesting of fear. Uh, and again, I just, I loved how this was shot. I loved how it's going through the radio program and then it moves on to setting up the film and then it moves on to the kid that's watching the film, each layer of these making it more real, manifesting a larger fear, making that fear real and therefore, like everything else in American Gods, it doesn't exist until you believe in it, but when you believe in it, that's when it becomes real. And fear manifests it in strength. And therefore, there aren't aliens until you believe in aliens, then you fear aliens, then aliens are real, and then they kidnap you as a child. Sort of the basic summation of that opening sequence. Uh, but just, again, beautifully played by Crispin Glover. I loved him hanging in the cornfield also as the scarecrow. Again, reinforcing what world is. He is like the world's manifestation of fear, the power of that. Uh, and I think that that really set the whole episode up just marvelously, because that's basically what world does. He unleashes fear and chaos in the world. We have our return of Tech Boy, which was great, uh, who apparently wasn't killed, but was remade, perfected, simplified, focused, uh, and looking very Tron-like, which, as a fan, I sort of appreciate it. Um, but apparently, uh, Tech Boy's been working and manifesting inside our CEO, Mr. Z, um, and recreated in that format. While he's doing that, he's breaking into Z's uh, uh, computer programs, starting a hack in order to unleash all of this information, this giant data dump onto the world, which then new media takes and blows up everywhere. So again, it's sort of a perfect blending of tech boy and new media. Tech boy getting the information, new media sending out the tendrils, amassing all of the surveillance, unleashing world's chaos into, well, the world or, you know, locally at the very least. Uh, and I loved how it, this kind of manifested itself in the sense of going through surveillance and sort of creating this story of Shadow and Wednesday as these mass murderers. I mean, yeah, they've done some stuff. But I love Ibis uh, trying to, to calm down Salim there. You should take the, the news with a grain of salt. You should look through it with a little different perspective here. Uh, but the idea that media can then take all of this information, package it together, and sell this lie, this story, to the people. Um, creating panic, runs on banks, dropping information, attacking financial systems, all the work that Tech Boy is doing, then new media is being used to blow it up and make it bigger and have its effects felt throughout the population, which then, fear-wise, feeds into Mr. World. So it, it, it's sort of a perfect 
unleashing of godly powers uh, uh, on the uh, on the earth. And I think that was just it was a wonderfully done. It gives us, like I said, this different way of seeing God's working. And it's not so much attacking the gods themselves, but their helpers, their worshipers, focused, of course, mainly on shadow. Well, Wednesday also wanted and <laughs> awesomely Selim. Oh, yeah, I definitely I don't want to go any further without talking about Selim, who was by far uh, the comic relief of the episode. Seeing how watching the news stories and hearing these tales slowly start to manifest that panic in him. Uh, I mean, first off, let me say, I appreciate Salim buying Sweeney a drink. Salim doesn't drink, it's not part of his religion, but he cares enough about Sweeney to get him a drink to send him off. It's very kind, very thoughtful of him. Uh, but yeah, even from that store, starting to see as the news stories uh, play out and people are wanted and there's things and he's, he's catching that, then he comes back to Cairo and he's trying to get the TV on, getting sucked into it again. It's that sort of reinforcement of fear and worship and belief uh, going on here. The more he sees, the more he wants to know, the more that feedback uh, uh, occurs, uh, which again, great little microcosmic view of what's going on out in the rest of the world, or we'll say the United States right now. Um, but yeah, so seeing, and then of course, Shadow and Wednesday getting named and accused of the giant Bellefontaine mass murder and cops being killed. And like I mentioned before, even Ibis trying to warn Salim, hey, you know, maybe you should watch things with a little, little, little grain of salt there, man. Don't, don't take everything. Have a skeptic's eye. I believe was the term that he used. Uh, but even that doesn't really work uh, until he sees himself being named out. And then he's like, I didn't do these. Did you do these things, Shadow? I didn't do these. What's going on? So it was just, I just, I love seeing Salim's reaction. And the fact that despite all of this, he is still committed uh, to a freak. Uh, which, you know, again, just shows sort of the strength of their relationship, which was something that worked a little bit more in this episode as well. We got a little bit of, you know, Efreet showing, uh, uh, showing Salim uh, some connection and stuff there. It was a great kiss. It's a nice moment between the two of them. Uh, but it always felt like there was a little bit of kind of pushing and distance, and now at least we seem to have a better partnership, uh, camaraderie being formed between Salim and Efreet, so... I like seeing that too. So Shadow and Laura. Um, looks like this is the end of their relationship. Looks like uh, despite Laura's kind of uh, wanting to be connected with Shadow, I think it's just there's too much stuff that has happened between them. And I, I'd, I'd like to think that this is all kind of moving forward uh, and, and, and moving on, that this was kind of the last hurrah. Uh, their relationship has just kind of bored me. It's not really going anywhere. I much prefer um, Laura with Sweeney. Uh, I know not a lot of people are necessarily into that, but I think at least they have some better connection. Uh, and the fact that at the end that we have Laura walking away with Sweeney's body, I think is kind of appropriate. She's got his coin. Now, that's, now it's dead wife and dead leprechaun. She's just a little more mobile than he is. But it does give me hope that maybe he will get his lucky coin back. Maybe this isn't the end that we'll see of uh, of Sweeney. So that would be kind of nice to see. Uh, but yeah, between Laura and Shadow, it definitely seems to sort out. We did get a little, little history. We got to see why she calls him puppy. She wanted a puppy. And he said no and just said, fine, you can call me puppy. Uh, but when he says, don't call me that anymore, that's, I think, when you're losing and you're denying the cute little relationship names... That's generally pretty much the, the line that that was. So, Laura now, obviously walking off with Sweeney. Uh, also, let me mention with Laura, loved her trying to get Bill Quiss on her side uh, about going after Wednesday. Asking Shadow, don't stand in my way. And Shadow didn't really give an answer to that when she said, I'm going to kill Wednesday, will you stand in my way? What did he respond? It's a free country. It's not a yes or a no. It's not really an answer. It's non-committal. 
So that was kind of interesting. So, but anyway, I loved her trying to get Bilquis on her side to go after Wednesday, which Bilquis not really in that space right now, but appreciates the offer. Uh, what was it, Laura said? I can recognize that that desire to punch in the face look, something like that. Uh, so that would be kind of an interesting thing. Dead wife and Bilquis going after Wednesday. Yeah, that'd be fun to see. But Shadow here uh, does have some final big movement forward. I mean, not, not necessarily a lot. A little bit of panic seeing things going on in the news. Not quite so, well, not quite so panicky as Salim did. Much more of a focused idea. Get stuff, get a plan, get out before the police come in. Everything's going south. Um, nice little moment there with Bill Quist. Uh, telling him to uh, to find his true self, find, uh, find out who you are. It's kind of a nice little moment. She's sort of propelling him forward. But even this all, while I, I appreciate where Shadow was going, this is one of those where, like I said, it seems to have been so stretched out uh, this season that it was finally by the time that he has his little series of visions why the world tree is yanking him back up, which actually did give, make me think of Nancy the other week when talking about uh, uh, Igudzil. God, I always trip over that. Uh, the world tree, just going to use the English term, um, that that might be what Shadow was being hung from. So as it was pulling him up, that's all I was thinking is, oh my God, he's going to get pulled up, he's going to get hung from the world tree, and he's going to be his sacrifice, Wednesday's sacrifice to the police. That's the way it seemed to have been going. Uh, and yet, through his sequence of flashbacks and remembrances and moments, he finally pieces together what everybody else has known for most of this season, even if you haven't read the books, uh, or the book, rather, um, is that Shadow is Wednesday's son. We had the fortune told, like father, like son, they're both con men, they're both cheats, uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday mentioned several times, you remind me of my son and things like that. His mom talking about who his father was, that he was a cheat, that he was a bad man. I mean, all of these small little moments finally kind of flashing and come together. So, while I'm glad that he went that way, it seemed really like literally spelled out. For anybody that wasn't paying attention and hadn't put these pieces together, they pretty much laid out each kind of moment there. So it was really kind of handed to us as an audience. If you haven't realized it yet, here's the answer, Wednesday, son. It's sort of, I had the feel for that. Um, but the manifestation of his powers, that was kind of interesting. And again, everything is all very dreamlike. There's some definite questions going on. We had all the police coming in and we have Wednesday or, or Shadow it looks like a memory of a place as a kid that just happened to look like Cairo or just seeing him imagining that and flashing back and this is the imagery that's coming up in his mind in order to manifest whatever powers and abilities that he does have. Uh, basically, the police came in and that's what he's playing with and then the kid swipes it all away and then the cops are all gone. Which... Yeah, I mean, that straightforward was cool. They're coming in, and then suddenly everyone's gone. Where did they go? I guess this is the manifestation of God powers that starts to become very curious. Is Did they just disappear? Were they just redirected? Did they all change their minds? It was a cool sequence. It looked great. Got the imagery and all of that. But again, the questions that not the back of my head is, how did that actually work? Doesn't matter. It did. And that just manifests for Shadow that, uh, that there is something more to him. He realizes that there is some power and ability. And finally, that last bit uh, where we have Shadow getting away on the bus and pulled over and obviously sure that he's about to be picked out by the police. His name's been plastered all over the TV. Uh, and yet, when they look at his ID, he just hands it back and, Have a good night, Mr. Ainsel. Boom! His ID's changed! It's no longer Shadow Moon, it is Michael Ainsel, and he's able to get away. 
Uh, now, Ainsel itself is a kind of a play on words. Uh, Ainsel is a old, it's the name of an old uh, Northumbrian uh, folk tale uh, by Joseph Jacobs, I believe, 1137, way back when. Uh, but it's basically, it's translated to my own self. Uh, Ainsel, my own self, my own self, Ainsel. Anyway, you know, Gaelic transitions to English. Uh, but it's basically the story of a fairy who is beaten by a small child due to clever wordplay. Um, briefly, uh, kid's not going to bed, goes downstairs to play. A fairy comes down the, uh, um, the chimney, introduces herself as my own self, to which the kid replies, Hey, oh, I'm just my own self too. Ha 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 ha. Anyway, the two are playing, the fire pops, lands on the fairy's foot, she screams, complains, the fairy's mom calls down from uh, up in the chimney, says, what happened? And the fairy replies, oh, just my own self burned me. To which the mom replies, why you be given such a fuss if you burned yourself? Reaches down, pull the fairy back out, that scares the kid enough, he runs to bed, never misses his bedtime again. Um, so yeah, it's just, again, it's a clever uh, play on words, but it also is really implying that sort of, uh, that, that fairy, that otherworldly being um, that Shadow is. So it was kind of a, a perfect little way of doing that, and again, showing that further manifestation of Shadow's power. Though we did have Odin uh, saying that his son's going to be just fine, just fine. No thanks to him, man. He just took off, didn't he? Just just sitting in a diner the whole time. You know, it was kind of interesting that uh, none of the news reports bothered him at all. He is a clever con man, isn't he? Oh, and I don't want to wrap things up without mentioning the lovely uh, dialogue exchanges between Nancy and Ibis uh, as they're playing chess and the world sort of falls apart around them. I kind of get the idea this is almost these two actors just improvising and just sort of playing off whatever's going on. There was just sort of a natural uh, a pattern of speech going on between the two of them. It was just, it was really interesting. But it was just sort of fun how they're sort of commenting about the next moves and things to do and referring back to Shadow and what's happening all as the chaos and movement is happening around them. Um, also, Efreet coming in. Uh, <laughs> a little interesting question Ibis throws at Efreet there, too. W what is your ability? How far against Wednesday's wishes, Wednesday's orders, can you go? I love his, his scary response. Well, I can kill anyone or anything I want. Nancy's like, oh, you saw it sounded so scary when you say things like that. Again, it's just, that's the fun dynamic between these characters. I think it really worked in this episode, and I'm glad they got a little bit of playtime. Not so serious, just more like gods messing with each other, which was fun. So that's sort of where uh, we leave things with this season. World has unleashed panic and chaos, uh, sort of feeding on that that, that uh, fear feedback system, the more you learn, the more you got to watch, and that feeds into uh, new media, who's feeding it all back into world, and we got Tech Boy doing damage. Again, love all that. Love his little conversations with Z there. Again, re rebuilding onto God's not, uh, you're not made in God's image, God is made onto your image. Uh, also, the idea of my power is goes as far as your imagination and that's the problem because imagination is only limited by fear again we're, we're feeding back into these ideas but this is sort of this is how world is doing his attack against the the old gods and it was just again i'm not sure how all this is going to continue to play out but i love seeing the battlefield sort of being set i just wish we got more of that to see this season and don't have to wait uh, all the way up until next season um, Wednesday is off somewhere. Not sure what he is doing. Uh, Shadow also on the run. Is he running from uh, Odin? Is he going to end up running back to Odin? And everybody else, Ibis, Nancy, they're off and loose and going to be gathering up 
in the next location. So yeah, it kind of leaves things with everybody out and on the run and separated, uh, but at least the battle seems to have begun. Uh, the war uh, has really begun to be engaged. So very sad. We have to wait a whole nother year to see how this plays out, but I did appreciate how this episode moved forward and sort of closed out this season. At least we have places to go now. So that is going to wrap us up. Thank you so much for watching these reviews all season long. Hopefully you will come back next season. Uh, but we do have some things coming up right now. We've got Game of Thrones final season. That's going on right now. We've got three more episodes. Well, tonight's episode and then three more after this. Uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. returns for season six on May 10th. Looks like we're going to have a Legion returning in August. So got some great fun fair coming forward. Uh, still waiting to hear uh, on when Mr. Robot comes back for its final season as well. So those are all the things we've got coming up. But we're going to wrap this up for now. Again, thank you for joining me. What did you guys think of this episode? What did you guys think of the season and where we're going? Has it kept you engaged? Has it re-engaged you? Has it lost you? Let me know what you guys are thinking. Throw your ideas right down in that comment section below. You can always catch me on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Darren Jakes. And again, a lot of shows coming up. Don't miss them. You won't if you're a subscriber. Do that by clicking this button right here. And we'll throw up a couple of our latest reviews right here for you to check out. Anyway, that's going to be it for me. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm D, and I'm out of here. Catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.